So I welcome Beast Builders to, to the Together for Peace webinar series. We are all here today to learn about peace builders from around the world to inspire, motivate, and help you take action for peace today, even while we are all at home. Before I start, I would like to thank the amazing production team, Anna De Silva, Anis Zaman, Daniel Hollis, and Cody Visnick for their exceptional work. I also would like to thank RAG of B members, dedicated audience, and Rotarian Action Group for Peace Leadership for their support. Today, we are so honored to have such a kind-hearted soul to be our guest on Together for Peace. Bob's depth and multi-dimensional experiences will leave you inspired to act for peace. Bob Reed is a world-class thought leader on philanthropy and volunteerism. He is the CEO of JF Maddox Foundation, one of the largest private foundations in New Mexico. Bob has a strong commitment and sense of social justice that he continues to apply through his service on several governing boards for private and public organizations, including about a dozen healthcare organizations. Throughout his career, Bob has founded and led multiple impactful nonprofits addressing the needs of the most vulnerable. Bob is a true philanthropist, serial volunteer, dedicated Rotarian, and active researcher. He spends his time engineering sustainable positive change through serving on projects with Rotary, United for Change, Salvation Army, Habitat for Humanity, and countless others. He has conducted one of a kind research and lectures on philanthropic practices that have inspired what, uh, hundreds of organizations. Despite his busy schedule, he's generous with his time and wisdom by serving as a professional and personal mentor to 30 individuals. Bob leads by example to pursue his life's mission, which is to elevate human dignity, prevent domestic violence, improve literacy and food insecurity, um, and provide health care for all. He advocates for a sustainable approach to women's empowerment and community development as the catalyst to address these complex issues. By empowering the unseen, the most vulnerable, and those who are struggling, Bob elevates the potential for humanity. Through this belief system and actions, he has bettered the lives of many people in Tanzania, Bolivia, East Africa, and the US, among other places. Bob's impressive accomplishments revolve around his love and loyalty for the most vulnerable. He's one of the most driven, humble, and caring world leaders I have ever met. I personally feel inspired, enriched, and empowered by his thoughts, actions, and character. Without further ado, let us dig deeper into Bob's multidimensional spirit. So Bob, to kick it off, I will ask you, um, about the most, the people you love the most, the most vulnerable. You call them your people. How, I, and I, I recall from our last conversation how you were first introduced to them and got to know them um, better as an intern in your school. So tell us why did you fall in love with, with them and how you came to, to know more about them? Sure. So, in my early college days, I thought I was going to be a behavioral science major. And I had a lot of interest in the subject matter, but not much maturity in how I actually brought it to a completion. So I ended up changing my major several times. And I think I have enough uh, undergraduate units of between three and four degrees in the behavioral sciences, but I never finished any one of them. I ended up graduating from four business schools instead. Uh, because my ideas were uh, more developed than my maturity. Uh, I was really impressed with myself back then. Uh, but I had this wonderful opportunity through one of the classes that I took at Cal Poly Pomona to do an inter internship in Skid Row, Los Angeles. And um, I, I went in and I was part of a national grant uh, taking uh, what were essentially uh, homeless shelters and converting them to treatment programs, putting treatment protocols in place, and then going out and recruiting people to come in. And you know, here I am, 20 years old, and uh, I'm walking the back alleys of Skid Row, Los Angeles, looking for 
people that are in desperate circumstances to see if they would like to come into these facilities that we're uh, creating and designing. And uh, <clears throat> what, I, what I learned was these were incredible human beings. These were people that society had turned its back on because they're not very pleasant. They don't smell well, they don't look good, they panhandle. There are lots of things that, that about their behavior that is egregious to most people in public. But when you get to know them, you find out their fathers, their mothers, their brothers and sisters, cousins and aunts, uh, and they're incredibly generous people. What struck me was two things. One was that they, all they might've had would have been the shirt on their back and time after time, the acts of generosity were such that they would have given me the shirt right off their back if, wow. I, if I needed it. Second, when I was walking through those alleys, the slasher was active in LA and there was a lot of violence going on. It was a scary place. And they sort of sent the word out in throughout Skid Row, look out for Bob. They were watching out for me. I was silly. I had no idea what I was dealing with. And I've always thought I was tough, but I really wasn't. They looked out for me. I fell in love with these folks as we worked with them and got to know their spirits. These were incredible human beings. And they actually fed me in this process spiritually. So I learned so much from that. And it was, it was a life-defining experience for me that I have never forgotten and have never retreated from. Obviously, because you went on to start your own nonprofit to offer them uh, medical services. So I would like, at 24, would you like to share this story with us? Like your, your follow-up was incredible. <laughs> yeah, actually, 24 or 26, it was somewhere in that area. Yeah. I was very fortunate to have a group of friends that had a similar interest. And I had whetted this appetite in Skid Row, Los Angeles, and really wanted to have an opportunity to uh, work toward the development of uh, a similar project. And there was an opportunity in the Bay Area of California. Uh, some funds had become available and uh, I worked with my colleagues. We put together a proposal and we went and we competed and we won uh, the funding. And that resulted in the creation of an incredible facility. It was a huge, the largest freestanding treatment facility for street people in Northern California. It was on 28 acres of landscaped um, hillside. <laughs> we brand new buildings built with HUD funds. It looked like a small college campus. Yeah. And so it, I took a six year oath of poverty and uh, we fought hard for uh, that, that group of people and had a lot of success. And, and it was really quite wonderful. Um, I, I would love to tell you a story about one person in particular, uh, a man named Richard who had been in and out of jail, was a terrible drunk and drug addict, uh, had committed so many different crimes. And he was a real curmudgeon. He was difficult to get along with. Nobody really liked him. And he ended up in our facility. Um, and he found out where I lived. And he would come over and he would steal my vegetables out of my, my vegetable garden. And uh, we ended up becoming incredibly close friends. Uh, and I had a chance to watch him grow and develop in this project and then to see him turn around and provide support and guidance for others who had come through a similar situation. Uh, he, I had no technical skills. I, I tried to take woodshop in high school and flunked. Uh, they, they took me out and made me take Latin. Uh, but I had a bonus room that I needed to uh, go in and put sheetrock in, and I didn't have a clue how to do this. So I hired Richard to show me how to do this. I couldn't afford to hire somebody to put the sheetrock in for me, but I paid him to show me how to do it. And I put it all in, I was, it was all complete. And then I had a little accident that an adjuster had to come out for. And he went up to look at my work and he was scratching his head and I said, what? He said, I've done this business for 20 years and I've never seen a whole room of sheetrock hung backwards. <laughs> So Richard had taught me how to sheet, how to hang sheetrock backwards. Here's the miracle of all of this. He came to me to borrow money to take some woman on a date, and he hadn't been on a date in 30 years. Wow. So I lent him that money, and he did the, He went out on that date, and two years later, 
I was his best man at the wedding for that woman. What wow. a gift. What an incredible gift. This is a, a striking story that he hasn't been on a date for 30 years mm -hmm. and because he couldn't afford it. And the moment he was able to take a woman on a date, they ended up married. And it's like, it, it's like an opportunity that a lot of people take for granted that to take someone on a date or get to know future partner or um, have a husband or wife. And Richard didn't even have that opportunity. And once he had it, his character made him worthy of being with the women for life and, and share marriage. Um, yeah. So Bob. And, and you take somebody like that, Reem, who nobody wanted to be around because he was so incredibly disagreeable and difficult to get around. He was just grouchy. And see him grow and develop and see his spirit come out. And to become, he loved that woman so much. And I watched him act out of love with so many other people after that. He helped so he helped hundreds of people who were in circumstances similar to his own. Wow. So why would you not why you were not mad at him for stealing your vegetables? Like because <laughs> I mean any any average person was like, oh my gosh, I don't want to deal with this. Well, lest I confuse you about my sainthood, uh, I was not upset about the uh, the vegetables. Uh, I just laughed about that. I, I said a few angry things about the sheetrock, uh, but I said it to myself. I didn't say it to him. <laughs> that is so incredible. So Richard and you are now friends and he started as- Richard uh, has passed away. He, he died a, a, about a decade ago. Um, he was quite a bit older than I was. Uh, you know, if, if you hadn't dated for 30 years, you can imagine I was in my 20s and I'm working with him uh, and he hadn't had a date in 30 years. So since before I was born. Yeah. So to honor Richard, what would you say that makes him um, a good friend? Uh, Richard and I fought a battle together. It was like being in a foxhole for the process that he had to go through. And we, we ended up, uh, there were many times we had lots of arguments, but we knew we could trust each other. I could trust him 100% other than stealing my vegetables uh, or his skills around sheetrock. And he trusted me 100%. He knew I had his back. Uh, and it's the greatest example of, I, was, I, had, I had the great opportunity to be present for him at one point in time. And he gave back in friendship several fold anything that I ever did for him. Wow. So I know that um, Richard is, an, is really an example of street people that we usually don't see. Uh, we, we think about them in numbers and uh, scale. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the end of the day, this Richard, the story of Richard reminds us of um, the humanity lying um in, in them and, and all of us and um that with little bit of help we can um help them re receive the humanity the dignity that they deserve and so i know that other people has inspired you you don't only do work like after that like that's your phase when you worked with your nonprofit that you started and you got mm -hmm. to learn about richard there but you continued your work um overseas and you've been inspired by people who lived in who are similar to Richard populations that are vulnerable um, in uh, South America, East Africa um, and other places around the world. And so I know that you have been inspired by a woman called Lourdes. Um, mm -hmm. Would you like to share with us her story and why um, and how she inspired you? Every year we organize a group of volunteers to go to South America. Um, and we've been working on a project to empower women for several years. And um, typically when we go down there, we also take a lot of supplies. We have many people that are in very desperate circumstances. And so we deliver food and basic supplies to them for pregnant women. We bring all of the things that they need for when they deliver their child, diapers and a variety of other things. And that there's, a, there's a night before we did all the de delivery, where we all get together and we uh, fill these bags. And it's, 
it's backbreaking work because there are so many of them that we have to do. And there was this one woman who was working faster and harder than anybody else in our group. And I had not met her yet. Uh, I didn't know her from Adam. I hadn't noticed throughout the night that she only had one arm. No. And when I discovered that the next day, I inquired about her circumstance. She had been the terrible victim for years of domestic violence and it decided that she could not take it anymore. And was going to take her young daughter to Brazil where her uh, sister lived. But she could not fly because in Bolivia, you have to have the written permission of the father. And she was escaping the father. Mm -hmm. So she took a bus. The bus crashed. And tragically, she lost her arm. In Bolivia, if you lose an arm or a leg or you're deformed in some way, many people think that you did something to bring that on yourself and that that negative karma you, you actually bring to your village. And so they're disparaged against. Uh, and discriminated. Uh, she had to go back to the village and back to that husband after she lost her arm, but she persisted. She got up every single day and went to work and constantly was trying to help everybody else. She was focused on others. And as a result, her village came behind her, came around her and began to support her and began to love her in exchange for the love she gave them. She is a hero um, to go through what she went through. No human being should have to go through the degradation of the abuse that she went through before she had the accident, let alone to have to deal with the effects of the accident. But she was working harder than anybody else in our group because she wanted the women in her village to get the benefit of all those supplies. Wow, so her generosity, the impact of her generosity um, had changed um the culture uh, she, she shifted the community's perception and it is fascinating because we don't think about generosity like listening to you it's it's counterintuitive to learn about generosity from the most the poorest uh and then see the impact they have on changing the world the actual impact they have on changing the world so i know you're passionate about domestic violence and the issue, like in Richard's case, access to healthcare, that's the facility you've been working on. Can you enlighten us about, let's start with, with Richard, about healthcare. Why uh, street people don't have that privilege to have access to healthcare, and like why that is even a problem in the US, um, where I think you're most, most of your efforts in, in that area is focused. Um, yeah, unfortunately in, health, in, in the US, even with the improvements we've made over the last few years, healthcare is for those who can afford it, not necessarily those who need it. Um, and we've seen since the uh, 80s, a change that not just in medical healthcare uh, being less affordable, but also uh, we've seen tremendous cutbacks on behavioral healthcare, mental health, drug and alcohol abuse, counseling. Uh, and so the problem just continues to grow off the charts. And then we get surprised about why do we have the big opioid crisis and other, it's because we, we took all the safeguards away. We took all of the opportunities for intervention and treatment away that, that were affordable. And as a result, those addictive behaviors don't go away. It, they just accumulate and grow and get worse. Mm -hmm. And so we're dealing with untold problems relative to mental health today and with drug and alcoholism uh, because we don't have prevention and treatment resources at the level at which we need them. They're not even a third of what they were in the early 80s and we're 2020. Wow, why do you think that is the problem? I, you know, I, I think that we had a change in attitude that shifted in this country that somehow people who were in a position of identified need for help begin to get disparaged. Well, it's their fault that they're in that situation. And you hear this a lot about alcoholism and drug addiction. Well, that's a disease people chose to have. You know, nobody made them drink. Nobody made them use the drugs. They don't understand that that's an addiction. 
And it's not like they are doing this out of choice. People don't destroy their lives. They don't get up on a beautiful Saturday morning and say, it's sunshine out. It's a great day. I think I want to ruin my life. It doesn't happen that way. There are a number of factors that uh, this disease um, uh, you know, has, uh, contributes to one's uh, likelihood of becoming an addict. So we are, as this, I, I actually had an opportunity to write for the professional association in the late 70s, early 80s, the definition of alcoholism for the state of California. And we actually wrote it in, at two levels. We said there was individual alcoholism, uh, which we defined in very traditional ways. And then there was community alcoholism. And community alcoholism came in a couple of forms. One was that uh, attitudes around alcohol and drugs that are different than around other things that are unhelpful. Because there are a certain percentage of people who just shouldn't drink and shouldn't use drugs because if they do, they are going to be addicts. But we don't accept that. So we regulate alcohol differently than we regulate popcorn, for example. Interesting. Uh, it, was, it was outlawed to, to do what's called subliminal advertising in theaters where they flash so quickly the conscious eye didn't see it. Popcorn on the screen that made you hungry and you didn't know why you were hungry, so you went and you got it. But only until recently, because alcohol is regulated under a completely different agency, we had subliminal advertising for tobacco and for alcohol. That's societal alcoholism, right? That we would think that that is okay. Then the second part is the demeaning of people who have a problem. Because that is, you know, if we say that, that uh, denial is the biggest problem in getting people into treatment, right? Well, if you think that part of being normal by society standards is that you will drink, but you have problems when you drink and it's not okay to have problems when you drink, the only way you could be normal is to deny one or the other, right? Yeah. So society imposes a level of denial on people because it's a dysfunctional attitude. So we allowed insurance to do away with uh, traditional behavioral health care. Uh, we stopped providing governmental funding at the level that we previously did for uh, <coughs> behavioral health and drug and alcoholism uh, services. And the result is that the problems don't go away. And we, there were a number of us that said, you're not actually going to save money by doing this. You're going to shift costs. These people, instead of being in these facilities, will end up in jail at a much higher price tag and a lower probability of recovery. And that is exactly what's happened. And that's why we have more people in jails than any country in the world. So Bob, um, what can we do to change this as normal people, like as Rotarians, as um, civic community leaders, as day-to-day -day people, what is it that you think we should be doing towards this issue? Because we can't just, you know, be ignorant. Like we, like we, you can't unlearn what you've learned. So now we have responsibility towards this because you're explaining it to us and it's a serious problem that we can't just say, oh, someone else is gonna fix it. So what can we do to help you? One of the things I love about Rotarians is that they're not timid, they're not afraid to go to difficult places. The global grants that, that I've had the, the luxury of being able to participate in and some of the work through United for Change, we've gone to places that no other nonprofits are at, no other civic clubs are at, and we're dealing with problems that are unimaginable. But inherent in that, is a, a lack of inclination to demonize people for their circumstances, to recognize the human dignity in everyone, uh, and to realize that people aren't participating in self-destructive behaviors out of choice. They don't know they have a choice. They don't know they have an option. So if we change our attitude about others and we become less judgmental of others, then I think we can change our, our society. I think we can become a more compassionate society. And we can recognize and deal with real problems and not be in denial ourselves. That's very, um, very wise. And I hope that everyone is listening today is going to be an agent of change um, by sharing what, we, what you've heard from Bob today with your friends and your family and change even the attitude 
um, a little bit more. So Bob, going back to Lourdes, um, mm -hmm. she is a woman in, from Bolivia or like, mm -hmm. okay. And so why would you go to Bolivia to empower women there? Why, how, why is that even important um, when you have a lot of problems in the U.S. to deal with? That's the other thing that I hear a lot that people use as an excuse to not give. And that is this idea that, well, why aren't we helping the people at home? And the truth of the matter is, we are. If, you, if you've had the opportunity to travel to developing countries and to see the very difficult circumstances, you realize we have a very different frame of reference of poverty here than they have in these other parts of the world. And the wealth of this country is such that I think we have a responsibility to find a way to be able to help others, to be able to have more control over their lives and to live better lives. So my personal deal is, and, and I learned this in part from just growing up in some of the difficult circumstances in which I grew up, but also in working with street people. And that is that the people who are typically most disparaged or ignored are the people I have the greatest passion for. Those are the people that really mean something to me. And so United for Change, and frankly, my local Rotary Club gave me the opportunity to get to know uh, some of these women in Bolivia. And when I met them, I was just awestruck. These are better people than I'll ever be. They get up every day walk several miles, walk several miles, work all day long in a mine, walk back several miles, prepare the food for their children, take care of their homes, care for everybody around them, and the next morning, get everybody out and get up and walk several miles again. And they're working in conditions that are unbelievably unsafe. They're so bad that in some of these mines that they work in, if they don't come out, nobody goes in to check for them. They have a little ceremony for them outside. They assume they fell off of one of the cliffs in these mines. They're incredibly unsafe conditions. And these women every day get up and do this, not for themselves. They do it for the people around them. When you see that, how can you not want to help them? So, you know, I've, I've had the great opportunity to work with others in creating micro enterprises, in, helping these women to learn literacy skills. We in, several, in one year, we were able to teach several hundred how to read and write. Most of these women are denied an education after the first or second grade. They never learn how to read or write and they're trapped in the poverty. So, uh, and, and it was really funny because I, I got up and gave a speech uh, in this one village, several hundred people there. And I decided I was gonna give it in Spanish. And, uh, my English is not that great, but it's the only language I know. Uh, so I really messed it up. I tortured a beautiful language, but I gave it everything that I had. Uh, and then they had this woman, this young woman get up in front of her children, in front of her entire village, who the year before could not read a single word, read flawlessly from a book in front of everybody. And as I sat down, one of my colleagues from El Paso leaned over and said, she just puts you to shame. <laughs> But she did. But what does that mean? That, what is that, the change that represents for her children? I promise you her children are gonna be able to read, right? Yeah. Uh, but then she also learned access to healthcare. 80% of the women who are pregnant in Bolivia never even acknowledge they're pregnant until it's time to have their baby. So they don't have, well, they, they don't have prenatal care. And the mortality rate for children is off the charts because of this and for the women too. So we were able to connect them with healthcare and teach them how to manage access uh, healthcare uh, for themselves and for their families. But then lastly, to teach them entrepreneurialism skills and provide the, the equipment and supplies they needed to start their businesses. There are women there now that own their own restaurants, uh, that own their own printing companies, that are, you, you have a Shaw that was, uh, uh, you know, prepared through one of their looms uh, there in that particular village. Uh, they're doing all these wonderful things and as a result, creating a source of income and having more autonomy. Melinda Gates, it was absolutely correct. 
the Gates are heroes in my view, in terms of what they have done around this world. But she said, if you wanna change the world, empower a woman. Because when you lift the circumstances of a woman, they more often than with men, I'm afraid to say, change the circumstances for everyone around them. Um, I'm incredibly lucky here at the foundation that I work with. I work with a magnificent family, a magnificent staff, an incredible board, but most of the staff here are women and they run circles around me. And they are incredible human beings very talented, very capable. And frankly, now that I've been here 25 years, I can acknowledge I've only been able to stay for 25 years because of their good work. That's so humble of you, Bob. I'm, I'm really struck by how little that we can give to populations in developing countries and the, the level of impact you can have with that money and time and skills. Um, it, it really, hurts actually to hear about women struggling to to give birth and that women because it's like a metaphor that poverty can challenge life itself um that women can't even give birth in a way that would guarantee it um being done correctly and without losing the child and the women don't enjoy or don't have the time to recognize their pregnancy so it's just, it's, it's striking to, to hear you share those um, insights. So, which brings me back to a question, a deep question, a deeper question about purpose, because yes. uh, you said, how can you see this and not do anything about it? Trust me, Bob, not many people think that way. So how can you teach people to, to think that way? Like what is purpose for you and why it is important for people to have a purpose? You know, I think we are at some level a product of our own experience. And I was raised by a single mother, an uneducated single mother, and watched her struggles. Um, and was, uh, I think I was a feminist uh, from probably grade school on because from the third grade on, I worked and paid all my own expenses and paid rent to live in my own household, uh, bought my own food, bought my own clothes because I could see the struggle that my mother was having. Uh, and I will tell you that it, I, I had one funny experience. My first real job was in a hospital and uh, my supervisor was gonna be a woman. And she pulled me aside and she said, I need to know if we're gonna have a problem uh, right now. And I'm going, problem, what kind of problem? I'm going through my head. What, what is she talking about? She said, I'm, and the more, the more I delayed, the more frustrated she got. I had no idea she was asking me if I was gonna have a problem reporting to a woman. It had never occurred to me that somebody would have that problem because all I'd ever done my entire life was report to women. That was the most normal thing in the world to me. Uh, but that really caused an impression in my mind that she had to go to that effort uh, to, to make sure I understood the challenge she had experienced in her life. And I will tell you, I'm, I am convinced that as a world, we will not ever realize our full potential until women stand shoulder to shoulder with men in leadership in every capacity. And we are denying our own human potential. So, you know, I, I, you know because of that experience, I have a very strong visceral connection to the idea of empowering women. It's very important to me. Uh, and it, it is my opportunity to give back so much of what's been given to me. But I particularly like going where other people don't go for or, groups that are typically ignored. And so I really like working with women in South America and in Africa, where they frankly have been completely systemically ignored. Because I want to work where nobody else is. I want to be able to contribute where there is an opportunity to contribute and have magnified impact. You know, I told you that we were able to educate several hundred women and to connect them, teach them how to access healthcare, and we trained the healthcare professionals on how to work with indigenous populations. We did that for $36,000. To your point, the ability to, to have incredible impact from small amounts of money is really present in some of these areas. The areas that we're ignoring, the people, the humanity that we've turned our back on as a world, 
actually doesn't need much. And I will tell you this, there was not a woman that I've had a chance to work with yet who wanted anything for me that they couldn't do for themselves. They weren't looking for a handout. They only wanted what they absolutely needed to be able to do for themselves. These are selfless human beings who do incredible things. Bob, going back, I mean, I love what you've shared. Um, reflecting on our conversations, we talked about this tension between, or like um, the relationship between purpose and service and ego and how we as humans, um, like living a privileged life, we can actually be healthy spiritually and mentally and even physically if we're not serving others. Like serving others is key and having a purpose to serve others is protecting us from our own ego. Because when you're not focused on your misery, uh, you are expanded in, in life and you your shine and you enrich your life and surround it with amazing people. So can you elaborate on that a little yeah. bit more? So I shared with you the other day, a scene out of a movie, Pretty Woman, when Richard Greer goes to rescue Lady Vivian. And he says, what happens when the prince rescues Lady Vivian? And she says, she rescues him back. The, the point is, is that generosity done right is a reciprocal proposition. I get so much more back than I have ever given. Uh, I know that I have to give. Uh, you know, uh, I, he made a contact at me and told me that, that, you know, one of the villages we'd worked with in Tanzania, um, Sister Martha had accumulated 20 orphan children into a two room shack with no floor and no utilities and they had no blankets. And she said, we need to raise money. I said, of course, where do I send? had to. How could you not? Uh, Sister Martha's the one doing the work, not me. And this is the thing about philanthropy. Philanthropy, it, it's really important to understand. It is a vicarious experience. Uh, because in, in the foundation world, everything that I'm proud of, somebody else did. So I'm writing the coattails of other people. That's true in these villages when we're working with these women. That's true. Uh, the example that I just gave you about Sister Martha, uh, who's, again, a, a better human being than I'll ever be. Please tell when us we, her story. Tell us why Sister oh Martha God. is so important to you. And then we'll, we'll talk about philanthropy after Sister Martha. Sure. Sister Martha is an albino uh, and, uh, in East Africa. And albinos traditionally have been viewed as the lowest rung on the social scale. And they are thought to bring uh, dishonor to and bad, bad mojo to villages. So historically, they've done terrible things to them, such as to sever limbs, uh, they sacrificed them. Uh, and Sister Martha grew up in this incredibly disparaging environment where she was discriminated by everybody. And as a teenager, decided to commit suicide, threw herself off a bridge into a river, but she didn't drown. She ended up washing up on a shore. And at that moment, made this, she made a commitment to God. Obviously, you want me to be here. I am going to serve you by serving others from this point forward. She became an Anglican uh, nun and uh, has ever since been in the service of others. The literature refers to her as the modern day uh, Mother Teresa. And I will tell you, having spent time uh, with Sister Martha, I think she deserves that moniker. Uh, but she turned her difficult circumstances into the generosity of others. And if you meet her today, this is an incredibly dignified, refined woman. And she is so because of her commitment to others. So her generosity actually gave back to her who she is to this day. And she has enormous following uh, and fans like me, uh, people that, that absolutely want to help wherever we can. So which, which this is an incredible story of, of a, a woman who has nothing mm -hmm. and yet she is giving in generously. Like she has just a place to live and she shared that with with others because that was of help to them. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so let's talk about philanthropy, good philanthropy and mm -hmm. giving. So mm -hmm. you, we've talked before we started this conversation, we were on Facebook Live and you've mentioned the myths about philanthropy, which is, I love this concept that you talk about arrogance of scale, arrogance mm -hmm. of sustainability. So tell yeah. us about that. And yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting that we, we all want to scale our ideas. We all want to have maximum impact and we want to see that impact sustained. There's nothing in the world wrong with that motivation unless it stops us from doing what we can in front of us. If I am so concerned about the causes of hunger that I failed to feed a hungry child in front of me, that's not a helpful motivation. That's the arrogance of scale. I believe that ultimately we are all responsible for giving where we can. And we're not in control over uh, where or how or how grand a scale that we might be able to give to. I was caught up in my 20s about this idea of scale and I thought everything I did needed to go to scale. And it, it, I think it was really a function of my own ego that, that somehow I was gonna be so great that I was going to achieve things on this grand scale. And then I saw this mural that was painted <coughs> by a friend of mine and it had these children holding hands and underneath it said, saving the world one child at a time. And that's when I went, oh my God, I need to be focused on wherever I'm called to go. So I had no idea I'd be called to go to South America or to East Africa, you know, to, to be of service. Uh, and frankly, many of the times that I go, I'm carrying the bags and doing the, the menial work. I'm not the skilled laborer in that regard. I'm the volunteer doing what needs to be done. Uh, it's other people who are actually doing the skilled work. Uh, some of which I think are actually in the audience right now today, uh, like Carla um, Murillo, uh, like Victor Hugo, uh, like uh, Jimena Murillo, uh, Sonia Murillo, uh, just these wonderful human beings who are very skilled at doing this work. And, and when I go down there, I'm not the foundation executive anymore. I'm a helper. You know, I'm, I'm, the, uh, I'm the person that carries the bags. And that's what I need to do. But that's an important role because it enables other people to be able to do good things. So I have to be prepared to do what I'm called to do. And it's not up to me as to whether I'm going to change hunger in this country or feed somebody at this moment in time. I just need to do what's in front of me. I love this idea because it, it, it emphasizes compassion. We can pretend that we wanna solve and change problems. If we don't change those problems for the people we are trying to help, what's the point? Like, so there's no point other than you, as you uh, correctly said, it's ego centered. And it's obvious to any, any person who like people who are obsessed with scale rather than helping people who are in their circles. And you can focus on scale, like you said, but uh, don't forget about the people in front of you that you actually can be kind to and help if they need the help. My research uh -huh. suggests that one of the most important factors, well, I'll say two, the most important factors in effective philanthropy is an intense sense of humility. Mm -hmm. I have to be very skeptical about what I think I know. And the other is a very strong sense of empathy. How do I experience the circumstances that others are experiencing? How do I understand their circumstance? And that requires listening. And I will tell you that the problem with philanthropy, when you go to work for a foundation, the following things happen. Your IQ is presumed to go up 15 points. Uh, you're much better looking. Your jokes are much funnier. The coffee's always hot because no matter how stupid your ideas are, if, you, if somebody thinks you're gonna play a role in helping him get them funded, they're the smartest ideas they've ever heard. So candor is very hard to come about uh, in philanthropy. It's just because of the power equation that exists between somebody who's part of an organization that is providing funds versus somebody who's part of an organization who's seeking funds, right? There's a difference in the power equation. So if you wanna be a good philanthropist, you really need to understand that the power needs to be on the side of those who are actually doing the work, not on the side of the foundation. That's where the real secret sauce is. So if we can empower really good people who are doing good work and have a sense of humility of understanding the limits of what we can do, 
but really be in a position to support those folks in those nonprofits. No different than what Rotary tries to do going around the world. We don't ride in our white horses and, and try to change things to our standard in these communities. There's a discipline that we go in and we learn these communities. We make sure that whatever we're doing is consistent with their priorities, their interests, and that they are, that the beneficiaries are vested in what we're doing and are partners in the process, that we're helping them do for themselves what they themselves want to do, not that we're coming in and forcing something on them. That's good philanthropy. Yeah, and I, I remember reading one of your articles about good philanthropy and bad philanthropy. And you've talked about the framework of do no harm, which is a framework as Rotary Peace Fellows, we have to actually learn and apply in our work. So how would you connect the two for our audience just to enlighten them about the do no harm framework and how's that related to good philanthropy? Well, because of all of the arrogance that can, what we call funder hubris, uh, that can occur, if we don't counter that with a strong sense of mission and a sense of humility, uh, uh, it, it will impede our ability to be effective. Uh, and I think that that's not just true for foundations. When, when you think about, and I've really become a great fan of Peace Fellows over the last couple of years, uh, the training that they have is remarkable. And I have, I've had an awakening as a result of working with some Peace Fellows, realizing that the elements of the, the pillars of positive peace yeah. have to be present in any philanthropic effort in order for those philanthropic efforts to be A, effective and B, sustainable, right? Because if, if they're not present, it doesn't matter how good a work you do, it won't last and it won't reach its full scale of impact. So uh, one of the things that I advocate for a lot is these wonderful uh, Rotarians who go out and volunteer and do a lot of these projects. These are, many of them are volunteers. They're not experts in the social change aspects of what they're seeking to achieve. They need to have the humility to realize they need to bring in real experts. And I believe they need to have Peace Fellows involved in the projects that, that they are working on. As you know, we, our club has benefited a great deal from having a particular Peace Fellow, Jimena Murillo, involved in every single one of our global grant projects. We will not do a global grant project without her involvement in making sure that all the pillars of positive peace are present uh, with respect to these initiatives. <clears throat> and that allows us to be effective. And we really have achieved remarkable things with just a small amount of money from our club because the conditions were right. And there was dignity, there was respect, there were all of the elements that needed to exist for the beneficiaries to take full advantage of what we were there to be able to help them do about what they wanted to accomplish. Well, that's, that's a really important message which um, leads me to ask you, what would you like to tell foundations and nonprofits currently struggling with COVID-19? Like if you have an advice for, also yeah. for Rotarians, like if there's uh, something you can advise them on coping with COVID-19 and uh, giving. Well, um, first of all, um, this, the, the science relative to COVID is far behind the reality of what we're dealing with. And we know that. Uh, so for foundations who are committed to evidence-based strategies, you're probably gonna struggle during this time. Uh, I often have said, this is a time to bail water, not to chart a new course. Um, and by that, I mean, we have to be more tactical than strategic. And, and let me give you an example of that. Uh, there's a foundation that I know uh, that uh, is very concerned about uh, animal rights and uh, animals tend to suffer greatly during times like this when we have economic displacement and add to that all the concerns around uh, COVID transmission. They made emergency grants. They got ahead of the needs of shelters to make sure those shelters before they ever made a request uh, had resources to be able to respond to the crisis uh, in a very timely fashion. We are working, as you know, I'm, I'm, I'm involved in raising funds with several really wonderful folks, some in Rotary, some outside of Rotary, for COVID-related projects in South America, in Ecuador, in Bolivia, 
and also um, in um, Kenya and in um, Tanzania. Uh, they're different needs. And so if you're really um, focused on what the circumstances on the ground are, you're gonna understand that. We're working with a wonderful um, Rotary Club uh, in La Paz, Bolivia. It's called the San Jorge Club. It is a magnificent club. Uh, they are raising funds right now to buy ventilators because there are not enough ventilators. I believe there are 120 total ICU beds in that country. 120 beds for 10 million people, let alone ventilators. We have another fund through a number of my uh, college colleagues that we've raised to provide uh, personal protective uh, equipment for healthcare professionals who have none in Bolivia and COVID tests to the Red Cross in Ecuador. Uh, we were providing blankets and food and emergency supplies for folks in East Africa. Those are very different needs. <clears throat> but if we hadn't listened to the people on the ground, we would have come in and said, well, you know, here are the five points that we have to make sure that we address in every single COVID uh, you know, philanthropic initiative. And we would, we would have missed the point and yes. wasted resources. Absolutely, because the ultimate goal is to start with compassion and help people resilience uh, through this tough time. Our duty as people who live in comfort to actually support their resilience. And if that means a blanket, it could be, it's a blanket. It, it's not something different. So and this is one, one of the reasons why I'm so proud to be part of the JF Maddox Foundation. This board of directors and this staff is so engaged in our service area uh, they want to make sure that we're taking care of people who are hungry, who are homeless, that we are providing the appropriate uh, supplies that are required to keep people safe. Uh, they're very dialed in and they are working on the ground level with those grantees. They're listening to them rather than foundations love to talk and that people will listen. If, if we talk, they'll listen. But we don't need to be talking right now. We need to be listening. And my board and this staff really get that. Now that's that's powerful. Thank you, uh, Bob. So now I would like to shift the conversation for the younger generation who's watching uh, and who will probably on Facebook and probably later on YouTube. Um, if you would like, you are such an inspiring character um, and your depth, I remember when I first uh, talked to you I talk a lot, I was speechless to, and I was in awe by your depth and your dimension, a multi-dimensional spirit. Um, and I know that like, your success did not come without a lot of challenges and a lot of lessons learned. So what is your advice to young people struggling right now with COVID? I know that a lot of young people probably lost their jobs. Maybe a lot of people don't have access to healthcare. Uh, there are, young people in vulnerable populations may be struggling. So what is your message to them? Um, how can you empower them with your wisdom and words? Because I know for sure you've empowered me. So I want to, I want to, to extend that to others. You know, I've experienced loss many times in my life, uh, tragic losses. And there have been times where I thought that I was going to lose everything that I'd ever built. Uh, <clears throat> and I had to become willing to accept it in order to rise above it and realize behind that is a whole new adventure, is a whole new opportunity. I don't know what it's going to be. I don't know if uh, my new adventure will be to be the friendliest Walmart reader in the history of the world, uh, or I'm gonna have some other role. It doesn't really matter. There are wonderful opportunities. And one of the things I'm so excited about from my research about millennials, these people get philanthropy. They really understand it. They want to go out. They want to be at Habitat Builds. They want to build homes. Uh, they want to help create micro uh, loans for people starting businesses and coach them through the starting of those businesses. They want to go out and help people uh, in so many visceral ways. I know that these young people have remarkable spirits these are very difficult times, and there is no question our, our pain is only starting. We are not through it. There will be more pain for sure. But beyond the storm, there is always a wonderful sunshiny day. 
and that will come again. And we will, if we really walk through this with dignity and concern for others and the commitment of service, service above self, we will come out stronger on the other side and ready for the, the improving circumstances that will occur at that time. Bob, can you share with us the story about good news, bad news? Is that what I recall? Like, I, that was a yeah. cool story. Yeah. And, yeah, it's a good one. So there was a village. It was a rural village. I love rural areas. Um, and th this villager, uh, was he was a widower, and he had a son and one horse. And that's all he had. And one day, the horse um, escaped. And all the villagers were really worried about him. And they came over, and they said, Oh, bad news, bad news. And he said, well, you know, because he was a wise old cotter. He said, bad news, good news, time will tell. So the next day, his son was out looking for the horse that had escaped, and he found three wild horses. So all the villagers come over, and they say, oh, good news. And he says, well, good news, bad news, time will tell. The next day, his son is out trying to break one of these wild horses, and it hideously falls on his leg and breaks it terribly. And all the villagers come in and say, oh, bad news. And he says, well, bad news, good news, time will tell. And the next day, the army comes riding through looking for all the able-bodied young men to the, take to the front lines of the war. The point of it is, is we don't know. We can never know what's coming next. And when we try to, when we're too confident in what we think is going to come next, we will inevitably act out of either fear or greed neither of which serve us well. If we can instead serve others, do the best we can and act in faith, things will be okay. They may not be what we want, but they will be okay. And through the service of others, our lives will be deeply enriched because I don't think you can be happy, genuinely happy until you are in the service of others. That's great. Bob, a uh, great um, ending before we transition to the Q&A, but before that, we still have three minutes before we start Q&A. If you have a call to action to Rotarians um, at this time um, that you would like for them to, to help in any way, like help your work, help the world, help humanity, help the people you love the most, the populations are most vulnerable, what would you, your message be for Rotarians? I would love to have more Rotarians join us in our work. Uh, we have several, excuse me, several projects in Bolivia. We really want to get a project going in Colombia. There's some wonderful uh, uh, peace fellows in, in Colombia that are doing remarkable work. And I'm in terribly concerned about um, the ex-combatants from the FARC, as well as these, uh, these um, Venezuelan refugees that are coming across the border that are being terribly victimized. But also, uh, I know that um, the folks at the Taos Club are working with United for Change to develop a project in Kenya. And I would love to have people join that project as well. Uh, we can't be timid at this point in time. This is a time to step up our game, to be more generous, to be more involved, not less. Yes, and as you can see on the screen, there's all the global grants numbers. If you want um, to look at it again, uh, please um, um, look at our live Facebook video or watch this again on YouTube. We will also follow up with this information uh, to our attendees. Um, and Anna can share it also on the chat box, uh, the numbers of these global grants, or take a photo of these global grants. Just don't forget that they exist as opportunities of service. Um, so Bob, let's, it's time for us to transition to Q&A. And I would love to start by our mutual friend question, Yale Jones. Yale, we are so happy to have you watching us and listening. So Yale has a question for you, Bob, and he would like you to answer this question. Can you comment on the type of leadership we need today? He would like to know from your perspective, what is the kind of leadership that we need at this time? I've, writ I've written a great deal about leadership. And um, I think there are a lot of fallacies around the concept of leadership because ultimately leaders should reflect their followers 
And I believe the power that leaders have is temporarily leased to them by their followers. So I think we need to hold our leaders accountable for knowing us, having our interests at heart. I, I'm a political independent, I'm like um, uh, some of the comedians that like to say, you elect them, I'll make fun of them. Uh, the, I have three lenses that I look for in evaluating somebody who is going to be in a leadership role. One is what is their motivation? Is their motivation really for the benefit of the most? Two, what is their integrity? Are they showing integrity and transparency? Three is uh, what is their competency? Are they really capable facilitators? Do they empower the people around them? Do they lead them in a positive way toward a positive outcome that is in the best interest of all involved? Notice I never got the political ideology because I, I've had friends uh, who have been presidential cabinet officers in different administrations, Republican and Democratic. I don't really uh, expect to agree with anybody about political ideology, but I wanna know they're motivated properly, that they have absolute integrity, and that they are bringing competence to their leadership. And for that, I think you have to have a strong sense of empathy and humility. Wow, those are gems coming out of your mouth, Bob. If we have leaders of those characteristics, I think our world would be an amazing place. Um, character, competency, humility, and compassion. Thank you, amazing. Um, now I have a very uh, interesting question from one of our audience about, it's a really interesting question. So he says, or she says, because it's an anonymous person, um, is arriving and working in poverty hotspots enough to make the systematic changes necessary to reduce and eliminate issues of poverty? If so, how and to what degree? And so, so, yeah. Yeah, I have a definitive answer. It's three words. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't, and, and anybody who tells you that they do know, I think you should turn around and run as fast as you can from. Uh, because the, the challenges confronting humanity are complex and they're intractable. And there are times where it makes sense to be tactical and there are times when it makes sense to be strategic. You rarely get an opportunity to do both, but sometimes that does occur. Uh, so I'm a social scientist. And uh, I, I love to do research around philanthropic practice, uh, and I love to publish on that research. Uh, I'd like to, to produce new insights. Um, so of course I believe in being methodical and rigorous um, in looking for ways to optimize scale and sustainability. But I also know that there is a terrible injustice in this world in the way that resources are distributed around the world or even within this country. Um, and there's no equitable basis for the people who, uh, live, who are below the 50th percentile of income or assets in this country. Uh, we have to be able to respond both tactically and strategically in creating new ways of opportunity. Now, I told you I graduated from Ford Business School, so obviously I am an advocate for a free enterprise system. I, I believe in it. However, I don't believe that it by itself is sufficient to create social justice. And uh, we are only as good as the person we least care for. So I really believe that we have to create a system that is concerned about all. and Ultimately, the, at the end of the day, the one factor that seems to more than anything else be correlated with successful participation in a free enterprise system is the effectiveness of education. And I've spent a lot of time studying public education and it is abysmal in this country. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for that, um, uh, that there are unfortunate reasons, 
And we know that SES is the single likely, big largest determinant in uh, educational outcome. So social economic status is the biggest driver. It's not the quality of the school. Isn't that interesting? Uh, yeah. It's not the quality of the curriculum. Mm -hmm. It's the home somebody's born in. Uh, and that's something that we have to overcome. Uh, there's a great uh, Harvard researcher that I had a chance to talk with recently who wrote the book, uh, it's Bob Putnam, uh, Bowling Alone. And his research says that today, your success is much more determined by the home you're born in than talent. Mm. That has to be changed. Uh, so the home you're born in, does that mean uh, your your access to um, values, access to funds, access to networks? Um, is it a combination of all these? That and literacy. The Coleman study in the 1970s said that on average, children will learn more at home than they will at school. Well, that depends on the home. Yeah. How educated is the home? How much opportunity? We have children here in Southeast New Mexico who have never left the single county that they live in. They don't know there's another world out there. This is powerful, Bob, because it ties to the idea of empowering women, because when you empower the women, you empower the homes. That's right. That's exactly right. And we have done a great disservice in this country. We have systematically uh, disempowered women and people of color and especially people of low socioeconomic status. And we have to reverse that. And if we don't do that, this, this democracy that we have is a blink in the eye. It's a very, I, I went to a friend of mine, Edie Hirsch, who Politico said was the most influential person in public education for the last several decades. And in, in 2003, I went to him, I think it was, and said, I'm really concerned that globalization, the way it's being perceived, is threatening to people because of declining literacy levels and that to participate successfully in the new global economy you had to have a higher level of literacy and more advanced skills mm -hmm. and that if if we didn't find a way to correct that if we didn't accentuate the importance of public education in in dealing with that that what would happen is that we would be open to an ideologue who would eventually come in and say see globalization was your problem and these groups are your problem mm -hmm. and democracy depends upon a high level of literacy and the ability to respect everybody's differences not tolerate them okay. respect and celebrate them not tolerate them and the perception that if i work hard enough i too can be successful if that doesn't exist then the revolutions that we have in this country which so far have been contained to a ballot box will go to guns. That is very important message, everyone. Please take it forward. We need to emphasize the values of education, respect the differences, and, um, and work on, um, what was the last one, Bob? Uh, well, we were talking about making sure that we uh, both respect and celebrate our differences. <laughs> but that we don't leave anybody behind. Yes. That we create a system that doesn't say these people are disposable. In California, they have a predictor for future prison capacity requirements. The percentage of children not reading on grade level by grade three determines the prison capacity they're going to build in California. That's a very cynical measure. Unfortunately, it's statistically accurate. That's why we have to create an egalitarian society with regard to education and pathways for being able to create new opportunities for yourself. Thank you. Thank you for this message, Bob. So now I am excited. We're having a Rotor actor, Riley Wayman, uh, asking a question. We've never had a Rotor actor ask a question before. So thank you, Riley. Um, I'm a Rotor actor, and I've been giving talks about the dangers of volunteerism. And he's between parentheses saying, for example, going to Africa, going on safari, having fun, laying a few bricks instead of giving that job to locals and walking away with an inflated ego. Uh, so he's been doing these talks to Rotary clubs. So he's elaborating and saying, the issue is that uh, questioning these practices often leads to many people getting angry or insulted. Um, 
it also doesn't help that with some people being a young person makes it easier to label me as idealistic or alarmist because he thinks that he's young so that this message might not come across well um, so what do you see he's asking you Bob for wisdom he's saying what do you think is the best way to discuss these issues without having people leave the conversation feeling attacked so well, he wants all, yeah here I thank you for caring enough to ask a question like that because you're proving my point that young people are very thoughtful about philanthropy. Uh, I'm, I don't think you've given me enough information to really be able to understand some of the concerns that you have. So I'm gonna to have to just sort of make some guesses about that. And I hope I, hope I, I hit the nail on the head, but we'll see. Uh, this is part of the, I, I, what I was talking about in terms of not riding in on our white horses and telling communities what they should be doing, but instead going in and getting becoming part of those communities, understanding their concerns, understanding their challenges, and understanding their hopes and dreams and helping them to build those out. It's one thing to go in and build a bridge for a community. It's another thing to go in and work side by side with them to help them to be able to do that, to not rob them of the dignity of being able to do this. When we do, our water projects, one of the things that's required is, is that uh, the, the people who are going to benefit from the water and sanitation systems actually are doing part of the work. So we work side by side with them. I have a wonderful photo of a young lady from, uh, uh, her name is Megan, uh, who uh, is in our local Rotary Club. She's throwing a pickaxe, digging a ditch, uh, but she's working side by side with the people in that village. So we're not trying in any way to do for them what they could do for themselves. But one of the things my research has shown is that in rural areas, communities have been so overwhelmed with challenges and resource insufficiency that they are discouraged. And it, it's hard for them to harness the optimism to be able to make changes for themselves. Having somebody come in who believes in them, who's respectful of them, but supports them and works side by side with them can stimulate that sense, sense of optimism that it, change is possible. And I will tell you, I believe in human resilience and I believe that people can overcome almost any challenge coming their way if they tap into the support around them, not try to do it by themselves everybody needs encouragement. I would not be sitting here today if people at different times of my life had not offered encouragement to me at critical times. So we all need it. And there are times where I need somebody to carry my shovel, not just tell me how to use it. But I don't need them to come in and take over my life. Um, Bob, just to follow up on this question, um, I've read an article about volunteer tourism that you wrote and the accountant women he was a true philanthropist to uh, to the rotor actor. Um, I think what I think the underpinning message that the rotor actor wanted to ask is how can we raise the standards for young people to volunteer in a meaningful way? I think and so by sharing by sharing the story of the women you met, uh, young women you met in that article. Um, I think you might offer him an alter alternative story that he can probably go and share with rotary clubs. Yeah, there were a group of women, uh, one that I managed to track down from Boston to Arusha, uh, and then a number of women from Europe. Uh, and uh, I, I punished them. I, I, I absolutely wanted to interview them, find out what they were doing. Uh, I was willing to buy their coffee, do whatever, but I needed to understand what they were doing and why they were doing it and how they were doing it. Uh, just because I just, I, I, I'm intellectually curious about this stuff. What I was so amazed by, these women, instead of taking vacations, they had decided they were going to make a change in the lives of others. So they took their limited financial capital, and these were not wealthy people, these were working people, <clears throat> and went and lived in these villages in very difficult circumstances, some in hostels, some in less, less than hostels. Uh, to work side by side with people and helping them to change the circumstances 
in their villages. And uh, they developed longstanding relationships. They would go back year after year after year, working with the same women that they had been working with, helping them to problem solve through their, their businesses that they had developed. And <clears throat> they were bringing far more than their financial capital. They were bringing the encouragement I just talked about. They were bringing the support in terms of consultation. And they were there to work side by side with them when they had problems. But one of them talked to me about the fact that this woman she'd helped build uh, a business lost her, uh, her source of distribution for the product that she was selling and how she helped her create another access point for distribution that, that, that this woman didn't know even existed. How did this young person even know how to do that? I don't know. But they were so committed to what they were doing. This was, this was not sitting on the beach at Tahiti. No. Stone tanning. This was using their, their vacation time to work in a humanitarian way for the benefit of others. And they were so excited they couldn't wait to get back the next year. That's a very beautiful, inspiring story. So I hope that would be the standard that we should aspire to achieve when we uh, give people the privilege to serve in countries to, and, you know, and it's not sitting on the beach in Tahiti. <laughs> okay, so um, Bob, uh, there's a question from Christian uh, Wolf. He uh, says, thank you so much for this. He loves you, obviously. Um, and so his question, how do you, uh, or will, no, how do we or will we know when our work is complete? So is so he is wondering when when do you know when to stop? So I think there is a graduation certificate one gets from this work and it's a toe tag. Uh, I don't think we ever stop. As long as we have the breath of life in us, we're on this planet for a reason. I'm not entirely I'm not I'm not sophisticated in my knowledge enough to know exactly what that reason is or what comes next, but I'm confident that I'm here for a reason and that part of that reason is my spiritual journey. And my spiritual journey was never intended to be all of and by myself. It was about to be able to help others and to empower others to be able to live their lives in different and better ways. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know where ultimately I will retire. I don't know that I ever will, but I can tell you this, I owe everything I have to the unbelievable charity of others and I can never pay it back, but I will never stop trying. Thanks, Bob. So there's a question, um, okay, from Nancy. She's curious about the women uh, who are mining and she says, what impact, if any, could we as consumers have on the conditions there? Ah, well, First of all, uh, you could go to the Fair Trade Store at United for Change Center and buy the products these women are making. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, give them an alternative, an economic alternative. Uh, and, and so, I, you know, I, I, I buy gifts uh, from that store for, for my staff, for uh, uh, family, for anybody. Uh, because that's really important stuff. And they're really wonderful products, by the way. You know, you, you have a shawl. Uh, they, they do incredible work. And it has such meaning. It's far, it's far more significant than something you're going to get that's machine made uh, in a department store. If you buy this, these products and you wear these products, you're wearing the lives of these women. The hope of these women. Okay. This is great. I have actually two great questions and I'm going to combine them in one question. One is from our dedicated audience, our fans, Jean, J. Dean, Craig, and Mark um, Har Harpizon. Uh, they're both great fans of the, of the show and very insightful questions. So the, 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 the first one from Dean, he's asking, how do you personally determine if a project is something that the community needs or something that you want to do for them? And that fits very beautifully with my question where he's talking, he says, it sounds as if you are a strong advocate, he's talking to you, Bob, of local knowledge in addressing issues at the grassroots level. How do you respond to World Bank, UNDB charges that localism often contradicts, for example, 
national development priorities or global humanitarian concerns, for example, gender equality. So how you basically mush the macro with the micro and, um, and how do you decide on good projects? It's a really perplexing question. Uh, so if you wanted a showstopper, that's it. Uh, but here, here's the thing, in my view anyways, uh, th there's, a, there's a wonderful joke I love to tell. I mean, how many psychiatrists does it take to change a light bulb? And the answer is only one, but the light bulb really has to want to change. <laughs> so first of all, if you're working with people uh, in a community and they don't want to change, uh, it doesn't matter what you might try to impose from a macro standpoint on them, you're not going to achieve that change. But experience suggests that if you develop really effective relationships, whether it's with grantees or whether it's with communities, where there's a, a high level of trust and ability to share information, you can begin to have an impact. It's like being the tugboat that's tapping the, the hull of an ocean liner, you just tap, 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 and eventually you begin to change the course. My experience is, is that very too, all too often, uh, both charitable and philanthropic gifts are too near-term sighted. If you really want to have sustainable impact, you need to be willing to roll up your sleeves and work over a period of time. So as an example, we went to a, a, a community uh, up in the Andes of Bolivia for several years before we ever did our first global grant, getting to know people, developing relationships, understanding their hopes, their dreams, their challenges, and at the same time, bringing in best practices. But if we brought them in too soon, we would be threatening to them. So there, there really is an art. It's not a science. It's an art of mixing evidence-based practice, or I should say evidence-informed. I'm not a big fan of evidence-based because it's all uh, past uh, looking. Evidence-informed, drawing lessons from prior experiences uh, and integrating that with relationship and experience that, that is prospective. Mm -hmm. But you have to have the relationship to do that. So we went many times before we ever started our first project. And by the time we did that, we had this wonderful melding of both the local appetite for change, the real desire, and uh, best practices. So, and the evidence of that is that in our literacy training programs, women did not miss the classes. They, they suited up, they showed up. We had one example of a woman who had gone home and had a terrible uh, uh, domestic violence uh, episode. Uh, her husband had beat her terribly the night before her class and he threw her book away. He threw it away, she couldn't find it. She was just humiliated, she couldn't find this book. And she comes back and she says, can I buy another book? Because she knew that she couldn't just be given a second book, right? Mm -hmm. And somebody said, oh no, here's your book here. And gave her the book. She would not give up her commitment to learning to read and write despite what she had to go through to get there. That's evidence that, that we had real local commitment and buy-in. Which really leads to a great question uh, um, by uh, Lawrence Pena. She says she arrived late to the, to the meeting, um, to the webinar, but she has heard about one woman who learned to read in a year. She came to the podium and read to the hundreds of the, in the audience. And so her question to you is, how did she learn to read so she can copy the program? Is there a reference to where yeah. they can find this program? Well, so United for Change, uh, was our cooperating nonprofit. I'm a real advocate of having uh, cooperating nonprofits in global grants, uh, just as I'm an advocate for foundations having really strong relationships with grantees. Uh, and they brought in the best instructional practices. They actually wrote the instructional book, uh, but they have educational experts that are part of their organization who, that's what I meant about melding best uh, best practices and evidence-informed uh, ideas. And so they were able to accelerate the learning because they actually had the materials uh, that would work for the grade level that these uh, women were at. We established, we did a rigorous review of establishing what their effective grade levels were and then designed the educational program 
based on best pedagogy uh, for doing that level of instruction. And then we had the materials. Uh, the women were so committed to the book that they had that we read a message from the author to them because the author couldn't be there. She's 86 years old and uh, could not be at you know, that high elevation. The women were sitting on the edge of their seats because this message was coming from the author who wrote that book to them and they couldn't believe they were hearing it from the author. That's how committed they were to that material. That, that book was life-giving to them. But uh, again, we're, we're, we're Rotarians, we're not educators. Uh, so we brought in the educational experts. When we do water projects, we bring in the water experts on water engineering uh, systems. Uh, this is going back to the idea that we talked about earlier, do no harm. Yeah. Uh, do not go in and pretend to be an expert that you're not. You know, <laughs> we need to bring in the experts. Otherwise, we give false hope. And I don't want to give false hope to anybody. These people have, they have endured more hardship than you could possibly imagine. And the last thing I want to do is contribute to false hope. Thank you, Bob. So I have uh, time for the last two questions. Uh, one is from Jimena. Jimena oh. is asking you, uh, Bob, you inspire many of us every day. Uh, what do you think we can do better to build resilience personally and in our communities? First of all, personally, uh, I think it's very important to understand that one's potential is dynamic, not static. Once we realize our potential, we have a new potential. Mm -hmm. And when we realize that, when we have a different potential. So that is what's so wonderful about resilience in the human spirit is that whatever we are today and whatever our potential is today, we have far more ahead of us. So we want to continue to challenge ourselves to grow. Uh, doubt what we think we know, be skeptical about what it is we think we know so that we really can be good learners and good listeners. Listen to others, hear what they have to say. Be willing to empower and distribute power around us to others because if we do that, we all grow together. And I want to make sure that I, I think the biggest part of, the biggest form of leadership malpractice is to stunt the growth of somebody. It's really important if you're in a leadership role to facilitate growth around you all the time. Keep people growing because their potential is so much greater than any of us knows. It's more than I know and I would assess for them and I guarantee you it's more than what they know. Um, and so we want to feed that human spirit and let it continue to grow personally and for all of those around us. Beautifully said, Bob. So the last question, um, before I ask you my last question, is what would you say is your greatest philanthropic contribution? Um, I hope that it's genuine humility and appreciation of others. Um, you know, philanthropy comes from a Greek term and it's about not just giving money, it certainly includes that, but giving of ourselves, the love of mankind. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I don't think we can adequately love those around us if we don't have a strong sense of humility, appreciation, and empathy. Um, and I value those that are around me. Uh, I've learned there was a time in my life where I did not. And I will tell you, there was a time that I saw the evil in people. And I've been, I've really had this wonderful journey, journey that now today, instead of seeing that, I see the good in people. And I've been able to work with people that others will come to me and say, well, how were you able to work with them? They're evil. But I didn't work with the evil in them. I worked with the good in them. I saw it. And I, I harvested that out. That required for me to get out of my own way and help them to be able to come forward. Wow, that is so beautiful thought, Bob. I mean, you've touched my heart with this thought. I know a lot of us are, you know, touched by your words. Um, I'd like to end by asking you about the impact you'd like to have or leave on the world. I don't know um, 
if my impact will be significant on one individual or on many. And I want to be humble enough to realize that it doesn't really matter. What matters is that if I was called to have impact, that I showed up. Mm-hmm. And that I, as selflessly as possible, sought to have that impact. That's why I mentor the number of people that I mentor today. Um, you know, to be honest, they probably give a whole lot more to me than I've ever given to them because that is the reciprocal nature of generosity. Um, but I want to be as available to them as I possibly can. I don't know who I'm going to be able to help, but I know that I have an obligation to help wherever I can. Very beautifully said. Uh, so, Bob, it was our honor, all of us, I speak on behalf of um, our team, the, the audience. I know everybody fall in love with you. Uh, we thank you for your generous time that you spend with us and for sharing from the heart and uh, from your tremendous experiences and uh, from caring for others. Um, you are a true ambassadors of the most vulnerable populations. I, I was in awe in the first uh, time we talked and I'm still in awe by how much you honor um, the people you serve. It's really inspiring. They're uh, my people. They're my people. And I'm honored to be with you, Reem, just as I was honored to be able to work with Anna. Uh, you're wonderful people. You have a wonderful organization. You're doing important work. Please keep it up. Thank you, Bob. So before we leave, I want to thank you all for joining today's Together for Peace episode. And I would like to remind you of some resources created by the Rotarian Action Group for Peace to help you act now while you're safe at home. You can become a member of the Rotarian Action Group for Peace if you're not, please join us. Uh, Also, if you are a Rotarian and your Rotary Club is not a Peace Builder Club, please go to our website and join us. Um, Share this webinar with five members of your Rotary Club, your friends and family. Help us spread the word of peace building and educational opportunities. Uh, Thank you all for joining us today, and we hope to see you next week when we interview Charles Allen. He's a Rotarian Peace Fellow and the Director of Partnerships for the Institute for Economics and Peace. Stay safe, stay healthy, keep your smile big and your heart open, and have a wonderful weekend. Continue to wage peace, everybody. Bye. (laughs) Thank you, Reem. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Take care. Have a wonderful weekend. I really enjoyed this. Me too. Thank you. Bye-bye.